we now move into round table two, which will look more specifically at mobilizing the resources to ensure that no one is left behind. Um, whereas the first round table panelists were largely uh, government officials or persons working with government, this second round table, uh, the, the people who really make ICT what it is and who make the, the systems work. We have more private sector representation here. Our speakers are Dr. Amjad Umar, Director and Professor of ICT Programs at Harrisburg University. Mr. Jan Bonnet, General Secretary, French Digital Council, who will provide a civil society perspective that will look at not at, at, as well at intangible benefits of ICTs. Um, Mr. Nelson McQuay, Chief Technology Transformation Officer for Latin America New Markets, Microsoft Corporation. Mr. Leon Williams, CEO of the Bahamas Telecommunications Company Limited, and Mr. Louis Guillot of Huawei Technologies Company Limited. For this roundtable, the guiding questions that we will, uh, that will, that, that will um, influence the presentations and our discussions are, one, what lessons can be learned from past successes and failures in making ICTs and digital services available to the poorest and most vulnerable? And how can we ensure that ICT helps combat inequality? The second question, guiding question, is what practical steps can governments and other stakeholders take to bridge the persistent digital divide? The third is what are innovative approaches to build ICT infrastructure in SIDS? And finally, how can SIDS tap into the technology facilitation mechanism as indicated by the 2030 Agenda, and what support and funding sources can assist SIDS in fast-tracking their ICT needs. And without further ado, I will invite our panelists to make their presentation, starting with Professor Ahmad. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you are awake <laughs> by now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, for the introductions. Uh, I wanted to, uh, first of all, I want to make sure, yes, the, the slides are there. Okay, uh, so I just uh, want to uh, do part two of the presentation that I did yesterday afternoon. Uh, today, I want to talk specifically about the rapid implementation of the Samoa pathway and uh, the uh, SDGs, and specifically by uh, using ICT. Uh, I want to <clears throat> move on and actually give uh, some specific information uh, about uh, both of the initiatives, uh, the Samoa pathway as well as the, S uh, the SDGs. Uh, in the Samoa pathway, you can see it uh, on the on the slide that uh, the, uh, the section 109 will very clearly specifies, excuse me, uh, yeah, this is better, okay, uh, very clearly specifies the role of ICT uh, in section H, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, section 109, paragraph H. It says, um, you can see the highlighted part, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but the basic message there is uh, the role of information and communication hubs. So the idea of uh, disseminating information through hubs instead of one large central site that, uh, that provides all type of information, these are the hubs. And then the next sentence as also, also talks about the collaboration between these hubs. So uh, I personally, when I read this, paragraph, I uh, was very delighted to see a very clear indication of a vision uh, that indicates how actually ICT could implement uh, the, uh, this uh, particular vision through a collection of hubs that collaborate with each other. And I am going to give you some information about how we are implementing this particular vision um, by using the ICT hubs. The second 
uh, information piece of information I'm going to share with you just to get started is of course the SDGs and everybody knows uh, the 17 goals of SDGs. Uh, also, there are many other variations uh, that uh, other governments have, have adopted and they are also conforming to the SDGs. Effectively, the, uh, what this graphic shows is that there are multiple sectors, uh, economic development, health, education, public safety, uh, transportation, and many other areas. Uh, and, and all of them are supported through information and communication technologies. Uh, so our interest, especially in the ICT for SIDS partnership uh, that I'm currently de leading, is not on one specific technology. It is not on one specific sector. So we want to provide and support the information and communication technologies and actually all the technologies uh, that are listed there, we are interested in supporting them. My personal interest is in using the latest digital innovations to help the poorest and the least served populations around the globe. I am not interested in using the latest digital innovations to make better uh, internet enabled bathrooms. I'm sorry, I just saw a demonstration of that. And uh, it was, uh, what should I say, underwhelming to see how some of the technology is being used for uh, somewhat frivolous purposes because there are some very serious problems in health, in education, in public safety, in transportation, in all of these areas that information and communication technologies can play a very significant role. So um, as a, uh, as a uh, researcher and teacher of information and communication technologies, as well as a practitioner in this field, so I am really spending most of my time on using uh, these technologies, the latest development in the technologies to the least served populations and uh, the poorest uh, populations. So uh, how are we doing this and how are we doing this by using the, um, the principle as uh, stated in the Samoa pathway and also in the SDGs. Uh, this is somewhat of a busy graphic, but if you just could focus on the top part of it, that shows uh, basically the vision uh, on the on the left hand side of the graphic, uh, really it shows uh, the pictures of some hubs. These hubs could be at local level, they could be in ru uh, rural areas, they could be at national level. They could support different type of topic areas that are of interest to SDGs. Uh, for example, for one hub could be healthcare. There could be another hub that could be for disaster recovery. There could be another hub that is focusing on education. Uh, so, and these hubs, when they start collaborating with each other, you develop very interesting scenarios of actually making advancement in a, in a bottom up manner, instead of having a lot of uh, agreements at the global level or at the government level, so you can make actually differences at the local levels. And we already have some experience of working with about 11 countries of forming these uh, small hubs at different, uh, different uh, levels. So the, it, the most important part is that these hubs should be designed in such a fashion that so that they com uh, communicate and collaborate with each other. And we have then what you see on the, uh, the, the right side of the graphic uh, is the uh, global center. Uh, so we have formed a global center uh, that is coordinating the activities of all these hubs. Uh, so um, by the way, I should mention it, that uh, IBM has donated a large scale system uh, to us um, and we are using that large scale system to house these global center. Uh, this is a place at the Harrisburg University campus. And um, by using this particular uh, facility, we can see all the activities and we can coordinate, we can collect data from different uh, hubs that uh, support different topic areas in different regions of the world. So for example, we have been able to collect 
data about hypertension from uh, different countries like Jamaica, uh, Haiti, and other places, and that type of information from different s sectors, uh, from, uh, from uh, one sector from different countries has not been available. Uh, we, are, we are not publishing it yet, but that is uh, uh, in progress. Similarly, similarly, we can have collaboration between a hub that is a disaster recovery management hub in one place, uh, one site uh, in one island, let's say, and that can collaborate with the hospital system in another uh, island. So this, is, this uh, gives you uh, an awful lot of uh, a rich set of scenarios in which you can implement these things. And this is directly supporting, number one, the Samoa pathway, the notion of the hubs, and it also supports directly the SDG goals because these hubs are supporting the topic areas that SDGs point out very specifically. So that's our goal is to implement very rapidly the statements that have been made in the Samoa pathway as well as in the SDG uh, specifications. So, uh, so the bottom part of this graphic shows the actual capabilities that we have built so far and all of these capabilities are available at the central sites. And, and these central sites, they communicate with the local hubs in different uh, parts of the world. Uh, the first one, and uh, I, will, I definitely don't have time to go through all of that. I'm just painting a big picture. Uh, so the, uh, uh, let me just do a very quick uh, bouncing camera evening news type of a overview where you know you just just talk about something quickly and then move on to the next one and then move on to the next one so so i'm just going to do that one minute commercial not even one minute commercials quick commercial on each one of them and then uh, but a few of them i will go into a somewhat detail to give you a better understanding of what's going on so the very first um, capability that's listed there is that of a, collab a collaboration matrix. This is a matrix that we have developed of all the uh, hubs and also the capabilities provided by the hubs and what are the kind of different scenarios in which they can collaborate with each, with each other. I'll show you a diagram very quickly. The next one shows the hypertension center and this hypertension center is being used to coordinate and collaborate other hypertension hubs that are located out in the field. Some of those centers may be way out in the rural area. Some of them may be national centers. And so we are developing a, like a, uh, uh, several test beds and actual system by using this concept and actually have a central site that collects all the information and we can do data analytics. We can do many uh, uh, analysis and activities at, at the central site. Uh, the next one shows the SDG advisor, and since I talked about this last uh, or yesterday, I'm not going to repeat that. So it's, it's an advisor that allows you to systematically uh, get help uh, on an SDGs, uh, step one, step two, step three, the steps walk through, and okay, uh, so the steps will walk you through all those. Uh, things. The, the last part I just want to mention here is the education center. Uh, we have been offering, actually I should say I have been offering a, a, certif a certificate for IT officials um, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and this certificate program is designed to prepare IT officials and local governments and also small businesses. I'm taking that particular idea and uh, going to start offering a training program for IT officials uh, in uh, small to med for small to medium businesses and also for for government uh, employees on how to use ICT effectively uh, to uh, further the goals of uh, SDGs and the Samoa pathway and every capability that you see here, by the way is an excellent tool for training. So instead of just talking to students, the, the, you need to collaborate. They can use a collaboration tool to actually do collaboration. Instead of just talking to them about how hypertension centers or uh, medical health centers can work, they can actually see the electronic health records being captured, disseminated, 
do some analysis on that. Instead of talking to them about SDGs and how you can actually measure your progress against the SDG indicator, they can actually see how those SDG indicators are being used to, uh, to actually not only assess their progress, but also to make the progress. And there are several things listed below that I won't have the time. Uh, we have just started another uh, initiative on smart SIDS. Many people in this room know that there are a large number of initiatives on smart cities. Uh, so there are some very interesting ideas uh, from smart cities that can apply very well to smart SIDS to make uh, and we already have a volunteer from Solomon Island. Uh, they want to apply some of the concepts to see how it works uh, for uh, for the Solomon Island, and then we'll replicate that knowledge to other places. So this is uh, what you're seeing here is almost a control center with a collection of tools that are very well integrated with each other. They can be used collectively to number one train and educate the IT officials. And secondly, they can be used to provide consulting and advisory services to people from any part uh, of the world if they collaborate with this part. So, so I'm just going to go quickly and show you uh, some actual, actual picture. I'm not sure if you can actually see this, but it lists on the, the rows are yeah, the, the, the rows are the, uh, the, uh, the various islands and also some of the cities, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, some of the LDCs, and uh, the columns uh, indicate the topic areas, and you can see some of the cells are being, getting filled where we actually have some hubs operating. So this allows us to develop scenarios where the uh, collaboration can be horizontal. In other words, all the healthcare centers in Samoa, let's say, can at the local, uh, at the regional, and at the national uh, uh, side can collaborate with each other. Or they can be vertical, where uh, the collaboration can be vertical, where uh, the, uh, the, the uh, particular topic area on a particular topic area, let's say disaster recovery management, different hubs could collaborate with it, each other or the collaboration could be diagonal where they cut across multiple regions as well as topics based on the needs. So that's just one part. And the second part is this hypertension center. I just want to say a few words uh, about this. This is uh, turning out to be a, a great experiment. We are working with World Hypertension League uh, that is uh, part of the World Health Organization. And, and hypertension, I'm sure many of you know, is one of the biggest uh, uh, killer in uh, especially the, uh, the islands, uh, in the small islands where there are some incidents where they're up to 79%, not only uh, causes for, of death, but also disabilities are caused by hypertension. And hypertension, is, it turns out, is one of the easiest and quickest uh, 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 situation to handle by having a small, uh, small help. Uh, so I, I just, uh, I think this is my uh, last, uh, 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 okay, uh, I'm sorry. So I just want to go back. But, but that, mm, that effectively is it. So we have all of these capabilities built. I just want to say a couple of sentences and then I'm done. And the purpose is, number one, is to develop a first rate uh, training and capacity building center, not just lecturing at people how sh they should do, but so that they can do hands-on experiments by using these tools that are available. They can actually work with the hubs, they can collaborate, uh, they can actually as make assessments, uh, they can run a telemedicine center, uh, they can also uh, do, uh, for example, participate in other projects also. So, so this is part of the things that, uh, that we are already uh, developing. Uh, so, and the other part is providing advisory services. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ahmad. Very interesting and very useful information as we prepare um, to ensure that we are meeting the very targets in our own specific context at the SDGs. Thank you very much. Moving along, uh, Mr. Jan Bonney will now 
provide his presentation. Ayan, you're not speaking in French. Yeah, I, I will speak in English. Oh, okay. okay. So, good morning, uh, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the United Nations for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, round table. <clears throat> so, as, uh, as you have heard, I am the General uh, Secretary of the French Digital Council. So, what is the French Digital Council and what do we do? We like to consider ourselves as a public lobby, a lobby for those who don't have one, citizens, SMEs, startups, who don't have the time or the money to lobby the public authorities. The council is composed of uh, 15 women and 15 men, all are digital experts, um, appointed by the French president. We are geeks, citizens, investors, researchers, activists, and entrepreneurs who are committed to one major purpose, to help the French government to, um, uh, to elaborate, shape, and implement digital public policies. We, knew, we need to leverage ICTs to change our economies and societies. I would like to briefly reaffirm the importance of the Paris Agreement commitment, COP21. We must adapt our economic and social models to avoid dangerous climate change. And I truly believe that ICTs are powerful tools to make this transition. However, the French Digital Council does not believe that ICTs alone will lead to a more sustainable and inclusive future. We believe that technological choices are shaped by political choices. The development of ICTs is not an uh, end in uh, itself. In order to reach the SDGs, we must not forget our collective responsibility in our choice of the kind of digital transformation we need. This requires more than technological adaptation. It require, requires innovations that are also social and political. The title of this roundtable is Mobilizing Resources and Leaving No One Behind. I believe that this is exactly where the power of ICTs lies. We can actually mobilize resources by leaving no one behind. In my opinion, the main strength of ICTs lies in their ability to enable new connections. It allows people to communicate and cooperate at a very low cost and without time and distance limits. This is why I believe that the internet is above all an organizational revolution. To illustrate this point, I, I would like to focus on, on one specific example. This is an innovative approach to building ICT infrastructure in seeds. It is the Caraib Wave French West Indies project. So this is Gael Musquet from Guadeloupe. When he was nine, Hurricane Hugo paced off uh, over the Caribbean, it left nearly 100,000 people homeless, and the damage caused cost $10 billion to repair. The hurricane blew the roof, the roof off his house. Since then, he has dedicated his life to the study of climate events. He rapidly became a very talented data analyst but he has never forgotten his childhood dream, which was to prevent disasters like the one he himself experienced. Uh, experienced. You, may, you, you may have heard of Caraib Wave, a warning prevention exercise piloted by UNESCO since 2011 to reduce tsunami casualties in Caribbean island. In the French West Indies, the population is not mobilized enough, and the risks are still underestimated. This is why, two years ago, a group of activists 
led by Gaël Musquet, launched the Carib Wave French West Indies project to help the 150,000 people who are at risk in Martinique and Guadeloupe. <coughs> it aims to reduce the damage provoked by tsunamis and earthquakes in small islands by mobilizing population through ICTs. The project is based on the powerful effect of digital technologies. Firstly, it can help to map vulnerable areas prior to and right after the wave using drones and $20 solar powered seismographs. Secondly, it facilitates the sharing of information between citizens on the planning of rescue operation by deploying Wi-Fi mobile areas and using social networks. There, thereby, with a minimum investment in infrastructures, it is possible to allow people to move to safe areas to connect isolated islands to collect precise data about the damage caused and share, share it with rescue teams to save lives. But technology alone cannot do much. That is why the project strongly relies on field expertise. This includes training programs for local people, school program, programs, awareness training sessions for public stakeholders, and so on and so forth. Last year, the annual prevention exercise involved more than 10,000 people, and this number is expected to triple for the next prevention exercise in March this year. It will be relatively, relatively easy to generalize to other small island projects such as Caribe Wave, but government support is needed. Because so far, Gael has mostly had to rely on the support of local communities. He raised 30,000 euros dollar on a crowdfunding platform, and this has allowed him to launch the first prevention exercise. And he unfortunately had many difficulties convincing local companies and authorities of the need to mobilize ICTs in order to leave no one behind if a major disaster happens. You can find his contact information on my slide. <coughs> Mobilizing resources on leaving no one behind, I believe that we, that we will need to mobilize many resources in order to leave no one behind. Education, obviously, is a field where ICTs represent a huge opportunity. It allows distance and flexible learning, which is critical for, critical for small and remote communities. Similar, similar, similarly, ICTs can make public services more accessible in remote areas. This is why we need to invest in building e-government. However, there is one lesson I want to share with you. It is the following. Inclusion requires a lot of capacity building and support. In France, we have been rather good at dematerializing documents and processes, which have contributed to the simplification of many administrative procedures. But by doing so, we also, unfortunately, reinforce certain inequalities. Let me give you an example. Pôle emploi is a French government agency which registers unemployed people, help them find jobs, and provide them with, with financial aid. It recently launched a big dematerialization plan which increased the agency efficiency and reduced costs. But if reducing cost is our only <coughs> criterion when deploying ICTs, the result may be a real disaster and increase inequalities. We must remember that some people still need to have face-to-face -face contact. So let's not forget that the digital revolution is not only about cables, it's also about people. 
No one should be left behind because he or she does not have access to the internet and does not master digital tools. Raising people's awareness and educating population to the use of digital technology is crucial. I am convinced it will, uh, it will improve social cohesion and catalyze the gradual dematerialization of procedure. To conclude, changing the world means nothing if a large part of its population is excluded from the benefits of uh, this transformation. That's why digitalization must necessarily come with an inclusion policy based on access, digital literacy, citizens' support and empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I, I find the recommendations very timely and, and in many ways speaks to the disparity um, and the bridge that has to be um, that, that has to be linked between those who do not have basic access and those who we want to ensure are included in the process of moving the digital, um, the, sorry, the SED agenda forward. And I, I thought that was that was very helpful. In some ways, it, it echoed, I think, to a good degree, some of the concerns that were expressed in the first round table from the floor. Now we have. Um, Nelson McKay, the Chief Technology Transma Transformation Officer for Latin America um, from Microsoft Corporation. Thanks, Ms. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, we will uh, attempt to show you how the technology and the innovation and the creativity is changing and will change with the times and uh, how to evolve and uh, revolutionize this world where we live that is divided. Uh, I would like to change that. Let's start. <laughs> Let's start with innovation, and if this helps me, it will be great. Uh, we live in a complex world, and everybody knows that we live in a complex world. Uh, there are too many things. I have seen a lot of them in the last three days here. Disaster resilience, economic development, public safety, urban mobility, social sentiment, personalized healthcare, education, pandemic management, water, services, energy. How do we handle all this? In technology, we have a path that is different from everyone. Our path is uh, about revolutions, technology revolutions, starting with the revolution that we had with the uh, machine, and transportation, the electricity, the systems in the last part of the last century. And now we are entering the fourth revolution, the data revolution. Only 1% of the data we produce, and I will show you how we produce them, is used for innovating purposes, to know how to solve real problems in the world. This is a data revolution. Uh, the digital revolution that uh, we live in is democratizing society, is evolving human and progress and it's changing organizations. And I want to show you how the organization and corporation that I live has been changed in the last years to this data revolution. You show us uh, sustainable goals this year, it took me the pleasure, the challenge, whatever you say, to manage our plans as a corporate with the UN plans. And we started with the mission and vision that uh, we have from our president. 
empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Satya Nadella. Uh, with that, we designed five uh, ways to deal with this. Uh, creating jobs and entrepreneurship, cloud adoption, health, technology for good and quality and well-being, and quality education, quality education and transformation. And we started to work on those five pillars. And I'm showing, I'm going to show you how we saw it. We saw it about, about health, education, digital, government, productivity, and connectivity. And uh, the way we see it is uh, the, there are in the 17 goals that we have for the 2030, uh, none of them is technology, but most of them are technology involved. I managed to put every one of them in our six pillars and all matched. But uh, during this session, I understood what happened. We are evolving in the United Nations, and uh, in technology, we have a revolution that is now in the data revolution. But that doesn't uh, pre prevent from uh, working one uh, with another. So in my personal opinion, uh, Samoa and uh, this group of interesting people that I've been with uh, in different EVCs in uh, LATAM are partners, and we don't know it, but we are. There is a book that we launched last year. Our other president, Brad Smith, uh, launched a cloud for global good which has three pillars, the NGOs, the education sector, and how to get the last mileage to the underserved populations. And we have been working for the last years in a project called TV White Spaces. You can see a video in uh, from our Jamaica example in uh, the uh, YouTube. It's Jamaica TV White Spaces is free. And you will see how we did it in Jamaica and how we did it in Africa, a project called For Africa. And that works. It's affordable, it's simple to implement, and joins everyone into a massive revolution on technology. The next step is the one that I'm encouraging you to see now, is the data revolution. How to handle the big data, the open data, the use of artificial intelligence BI for good, for the well-being of everyone. And that's going to be my last slide, my, my slides of presentations, how to make uh, reimagining the possi new possibilities for governments and uh, using today revolution. How to use artificial intelligence not to replace human, but to help humans to understand how to use the data and how to transform the world together for a better place. And uh, I know it's not easy, but we are doing that. We are reimagining the society with the di digital society in place. Uh, I've been listening to you on uh, the role of government and uh, the cyberspace and the cybersecurity, and it's a matter of trust. Trust that was lost four years ago with a few events that are not to be discussed in this moment, but I could show you where they go. And the new policies that made 40 countries to develop defensive capabilities and 95 to develop legislative initiatives. Now we are building 
trust with the technology we have. And it's not easy. It's like building a plane while you are traveling in the, in the plane. We need industry norms, not changing the past, but creating new ones. We need public and private compromises, but they both have different rules. The private sector needs to evolve from those complicated measurements of uh, only income and not society uh, inputs. But uh, to get to the digital world, we need to create something different. We have many, I put here five of them, which are related to how the government can relate with people and with health and uh, to uh, in unimaginable thing. But the thing is, the right hand side is the best. You can have a blockchain with all the Samoa group easily, not costly, and reduce the cost you are now taking for data, for data usage, for transactions, and for document recognition and trans transporting them. But the problem is that the sector, the public sector, can only do what is already regulated, and we have to change that. And the public sector can do everything that is not prohibited by law. So there, both have different environments to work, and we have to work on an intersection that is not easy to find. For you to understand my place here, we, not, we need to get the underserved people into the technology, but we need to know how and why. This is part of why. Everything now is Internet of Things in action. Many, in, you don't imagine the amount of things that are in technology in the so-called Internet of Things. I believe on Internet of Things, but I believe more on how to use that Internet of Things. This is agriculture, the next frontier in agriculture. This is the next frontier in agriculture, where IOTs and uh, BI and artificial intelligence is helping everyone to produce more, better, and faster, and easier and less costly. And I could show you here many things on people who are in involving now in this procedure, but I would like to spend a half a minute on this one. If you are a country with, uh, with uh, agriculture and cow production, we did an IoT project in Japan, and uh, we put, like we did, we used these uh, pedometers on the cows, and we started to find that cows walk more during the nights when nobody's paying attention. And, but when we studied the case, we saw that the, the, that was because of something. The, the cows and the, the way of reproducing was shown us because of those steps of more that they did at night. This project, what, which was a pedometer and Internet of Things, the cloud, made a lot of farmers produce more. More not only in meat, but also in milk. Why? Because studying the steps of the cows and the estrogen of the cows, we could determine three hours where if you inseminated the cows, you will have, you will have cows milk, and the other three, you will have meat. 75% of increase in production. That is easily done with the Internet of Things and Internet of People nowadays. <coughs> Both the four things are here not to be deleted, are here to stay. Internet of Things, Internet of People. And my last slide is about what we are here for to include people. That is the cloud that I know. 
this is the technology that I've been working with. And uh, that's why someone said yesterday, maybe none of the governments of today will be here in 2030. And I agree, most of them will not. Well, none of the technology we'll have today will be here in 2030. I don't know which one, which one will remain. What I know is that these three events occur in, three, in five years. In those five years from 2004 to 2009, we changed the world with technology. That's a perfect storm. The second thing is how to manage government and society work together. We have talked a lot, a lot during these meetings and how to use that technology with them. The third part is how the private sector was foreseeing how to work with the society and using the technology. And we built what we now call the cloud technology. It's the first time I, I spoke about cloud technology in uh, 2007. Everybody believed I was crazy. In 2010, nobody wanted to believe what we were seeing. Today, we will see how this is going to work. Data centers are no longer local things. Data centers are the past. Because data centers, as we believe it today, are centers where 600,000 servers can, can be uploaded in hours, 10,000 servers in minutes. That is not possible locally. The problem with matching these technologies is how to work from what the government and citizens need to what the private sector is foreseeing for the future, the close, near future, and the long term, 10 years. It's CapEx and EBIT, and we work together in mixed clouds. We have a challenge that was not foreseen for the companies here, the underserved people. The underserved population needs to have the technology in use, and we did that. In the Jamaica project, in the Africa project, we learned a lot. We learned a lot that with the installed technology, we can connect people and get massive people into the internet. And when you, when you are in the internet, you are a global citizen. You are no longer an underserved one. But for that, we need connectivity. We need broadband, and we need last, last mile and the intermediate. We are working on the last mile with TV white spaces and new Wi-Fi technologies, locally and wider. We need to work on that. And uh, then we have to classify the data and see what data is in the public and what data is in the private, local. For you to know, 75% of the servers physically located in data centers in local communities, in local countries, local islands, will not be renewed in the next five years. It's too costly. 75%. All of them will be gone to what we call the public cloud, where everyone, everyone is the same. Everybody uses, do not have to use capital, only OPEX you use and pay for what you consume, and you only need to enhance your broadband and your last mile connectivity. And that's why the private sector is here with public clouds everywhere. Only Microsoft has 36 of those mega data centers all around the world. But we need more. This morning, someone from Bahamas talked about how to do a virtual embassy. The Estonia case is a beauty. All the embassies of Estonia in a public cloud because of geopolitical problems. We need to have an agreement, international agreement, for 
virtual embassies everywhere. Every country should have an international a place in the public cloud that is reserved and protected by the United Nations with their data, if the data revolution is to have a success as it will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. Moving along, because time is not really on our side, um, I'll ask Mr. Leon Williams now to give his presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I want to thank the UN for the opportunity to present. And Madam Chair, I want to thank you for your influence. We'll take a simple tour through the Bahamas and talk a little bit about no one left behind. The world is involved in a digital revolution. Two pictures are taken by the same photographer in the same place of Vatican, the two different popes, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Same photographer, two different, same place, two different popes. One was the year 2005, the other was the year 2013. 5G. The FCC has made 5G a national priority for the United States. The 2018 games will be on a 5G network. In a meeting of Canto down in Trinidad, I met with the ministers for ICT in the Caribbean and I said to them, you need to make a friend with the ministers of tourism to find a space in the Caribbean Ocean to dump all the 4G equipment. The problem is many of the Caribbean countries, the SIDs, have not yet progressed to 4G. And so while the Bahamas is at 4G and we're looking for a glide path to 5G, and the 2018 games will be on 5G. And AT&T is already testing 5G. Many of the Caribbean countries are still at 3G, not having moved to 5G. The ITU came to the Bahamas in December 2015. And in 2015, they made the Nassau Declaration of 2015 in which they challenged the government of the Bahamas to make New Providence, this island that you are at the first smart island in the Caribbean. The Attorney General, the Honorable Alison Maynard Gibson, challenged BTC to not just make New Providence the first smart island, but make the entire Bahamas the first smart nation. Sounds easy. The difficulty, however, is that the Prime Minister picked it up in an address and was carried by the newspapers in January in which he accepted the challenge by the ITU to make New Providence, this island, the first smart island in the Caribbean. Of course, we've got the challenge because Curacao is also trying to be the first smart island in the Caribbean. There's always a competition in, 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 in the Caribbean. I like this quote because the ITU, we had Cleveland Thomas from the ITU come into the Bahamas to talk about the ITU's definition of a smart city. And so I like the IMAX, um, systems definition. Smart cities are powered by smart governments and provide superior customer services with a full understanding of the citizens' needs. So we've got that on our plate. I put this slide up for two reasons. One, for you to look at the Bahamas at the top of the page, stretching from Florida down to Hispaniola. Look at the Eastern Caribbean from Puerto Rico all the way down to Trinidad. The Bahamas is the entire Eastern Caribbean. I put it up for a second reason, that if you would look technically, the Caribbean Sea does not wash the shores of the Bahamas. The Bahamas is what is referred to in the Sargasso Sea. The Bahamas. The Prime Minister spoke about this eloquently at the opening, and he talked about the fact that on every island, everything has to be replicated. So there's a genset on every island. 700 islands, rocks, and keys covering 100,000 square miles of the Atlantic Ocean with a population of 350,000. 6.5 million tourists visit our shores every year. There are 516 hotels with 14,234 rooms. There are 50 
three airports in this country. For a population of four million, Jamaica has two. Population of 1.5 million, Barbados, um, 1.5 million, Trinidad has one. 53 airports, 30 owned by the government, 23 privately owned. The airport that you came into two, a year ago, LPIA, 87,000. Out of the three Caribbean airports that are US pre-clearance, two exist in the Bahamas, one in New Providence and the other one in Grand Bahama. American Airlines flies into Nassau, it flies into Grand Bahama, it flies into Abaco, it flies into Luther, it flies into Exuma, it flies down into San Salvador. The government has to have the connectivity in place so that security, immigration, customs are all connected back to the hub here in New Providence. There are 263 institutions. So, to be a little bit more definitive, the island of Barbados is 167 square miles with a population of 280,000. New Providence, on the other hand, is a Island with 147 square miles with a population of 274,000. So when you match this island of New Providence, it is like looking at Barbados. Trinidad, 1,841 square miles with a population of 1.3 million. Andres Island with a size of 2,300 square miles with just a population of 7,000. Trinidad could sit in the island of Andres, and I could take this island by island. So what are our challenges in ICT? It's like the dark side. That's the island of Eleuthera, with the Atlantic on one side and the Bahama Bank on the other side. Hurricane Joaquin came through, as the Prime Minister articulated, in 2015, causing damages of $100 million. Hurricane Matthew came through last year, creating damages of $600 million. It went as Madam Chair stated and um, Dr. Wells stated, it went up the entire length of the Bahamas with winds of gusting up to 160 miles an hour. Hurricane Joaquin sat over the Bahamas for almost 24 hours with winds at 125 miles an hour gusting to 160 miles an hour. The damages as a result of that, that's an island, Long Island, where the sea came into the land. New Providence. That's New Providence. I'm sitting on the back of a truck touring with the Prime Minister, and in the back, that Jeep in the back is the Deputy Prime Minister and two other ministers. We're in the island of Crooked Island right after Hurricane Joaquin. Let me say something else to this. When the hurricanes approach and there's a warning, all winged aircraft must leave the Bahamas. They either go south to Jamaica, but in the case of Hurricane Matthew, they couldn't go to Jamaica. So they go north to Atlanta, New York. So it takes almost 24 hours before the winged aircraft come back to the islands, and then for the prime minister to be able to tour and see where the damages have taken place. I can tell you, I was on this tour the Friday after the Hurricane Joaquin, and we flew all the way down to Inagua, and we came back, and the first airport we could land on was the island of Exuma. All the other airport, the islands on the airport, the airports on the islands were all covered with water, so winged aircraft could not land. The sea meets the land. Prime Minister spoke about this. This is the damage to the infrastructure. In the case of BTC, the company that I'm CEO of, $38 million in damages, island after island, tower after tower. That's in North Andres last year. Um, then Point, Crooked Island, tower just missing a shelter. And so I was tempted not to put this slide in after the intervention by the delegate from Cuba this morning. But here are the foreign direct investments that have been authorized by the government, approved by the government shareholders, and I just clicked through them so that you can see. And the reason why I'm putting this up is that the government has just spent this amazing challenge of having not of its own will, but it is mandated by the foreign direct investments not to leave anybody behind. And so when you look at the investments that has been approved by the Ministry of Investments, 
um, last year, $4.3 billion worth of investments. What does that mean? So the Bahamas are sitting it. It is connected to the rest of the world um, with submarine cables, four submarine cables, um, joint venture with Arcos, with BTC. The governor of the Bahamas built a submarine cable that links all 14 islands of the Bahamas um, in a self-healing ring network so that if there's a failure. So during Hurricane Joaquin and with Hurricane Matthew, there was no submarine cable failures. Um, the island stayed up. BTC is building a fiber to the home so that no one is left behind. We've started in the family islands. BTC has already beta testing prepaid electricity in the island of Spanish Wells. What is important for us, um, Madam Chair, is that all that we are doing, the private companies, it has to be connected through to the National Development Plan. Um, and so sitting with um, Dr. Rowe, we have to make sure that it's all integrated. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leon. I think what's been refreshing so far in terms of all of the presentations um, is clearly the level of commitment from the private sector to partner with governments to ensure that no one is left behind, recognizing that at the end of the day, it's not always necessarily about the bottom line, but about ensuring that real people and real and solutions are, are developed that meet real world needs. Um, our final presenter for the afternoon is Mr. Louis uh, Guillot from, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm somewhere between French and Spanish, um, of Huawei Technologies. Louis? Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the, the government of the Bahamas and the United Nations for the invitation to participate. And what I'm, talk, I'm gonna talk about is not Smart, every country is smart. They're successful, they're going along, nobody is like a company going bankrupt, they're working. Everybody is adapting ICT into their everyday work, every government. But we have to change what we're doing. And everybody knows this information that was provided by the ITU. If you invest in ICT, your government, your country will grow. Your GDP will grow, your unemployment will decrease, even Contamination will decrease. This is something we have to do. But we have to invest the money wisely. We've been using ICT as the same way we did government 100 years ago, in silos. Every, we used to do that 100 years ago because we didn't have technology. So we couldn't share the information from the Ministry of Finance to the Ministry of Health. Everybody needs to have a copy of the information. So you need to have a full registry of who was going to the hospital and who was paying taxes and who was new born. But today, the technology has been available for over 20, 30 years. And we haven't decided, sorry, we haven't decided to close the silos. ICT touches everything. ICT is transforming the world. There was an, an interview for the CEO of Citibank. And he said, we're a technology company specialized in finance. He didn't say we were a finance company using technology. Everybody, if you want to be successful, you have to be using ICT. There's no question about it. And this is what's happened when a, a smart nation really starts using ICT in a better way. You have all of your information generators, citizens, car, buses, airports, everybody generates information. You have them hooked up to the system, to a really good network. And that information goes through a data center. A data center that is shared by everybody. And what I mean is shared by everybody is that not everybody has access to all of the information. But everybody has access to the information they should have access to. And I'll give you an example, a very simple example. My wife works for a very large oil company and they have very good benefits. They have full medical services, they have schools. And when my son was born, we have to do the, the vaccine registry and we go to the hospital of her company and they give the vaccines and everything. But after we do that, we have to take the paper to his school that's owned by the, by the same company, give the paper to the doctor that's part of the system and she registered everything in the system so they can know that my son has been vaccinated. Those are 
this two databases in the same company that are not actually doing what you can do with technology. The system should have let know the doctor in the school that my son Seth has, has his vaccination. He can go into the school because he has the Influvex vaccine. This happens throughout most of the governments around the world. We have silos of information that we are unwilling to share with our neighbor. And we invented interoperability so we can share the information because we're, we are not unwilling to share the infrastructure. We have to change that. We have to go a step further. This is an example, and the colleague from Estonia has done a great thing. This is an electronic ID. This is a, an ID that has all your information. And when you go to the hospital, they know who you are, and they have access to your information. If you go to the bank, it identifies you who you are. Like he said, he can even vote because they just, just didn't do an, a physical ID. They did a, a virtual ID. So the Estonians have identification, legal identification, physical and in the virtual world. So imagine that you have this ID and you can go and register your son to school. You can go to the hospital. If you have uh, social benefits, you can get them directly to your ID. In Mexico, Mexico City has a very big social benefits for the elderly. Everybody that's over 65 years old rides free on the government-owned public transportation. Imagine if they had this ID, they go, place it on the reader, and go in. Today, what they do is they have a police officer at a gate. And the police officer looks at you and says, well, you look over 65, you can go through the gate. You don't look over 65, pay the bill. See, see the difference? See what can do? You can actually account how many people are receiving the benefits. So this is what an EID can do. Healthcare, I was talking about healthcare. Imagine that all of the information is centralized. You have all with the correct security, because security is very important, but in an emergency and you're unconscious and you're taken to one of the hospitals, they take your card from, from your wallet, they know who you are and they know what you're allergic, allergic to, what medications you're being taken. Eh? It's not a guesswork for the doctors to hope they wake up, to wake you up so they can take a, a physical information out of you. I, I know this from personal experience because yeah, I, had a, I was in a car accident and they couldn't do nothing until they woke me up screaming in pain and I said, oh yeah, no, don't worry, I'm not allergic to anything. Yeah, do everything you need to do. That's the biggest difference. A smart education. I gave you a very good example before with my son going to school and having access to the medical history. Imagine your son has influenza, the doctor says he cannot go to school, but you take your son to the home, but you have to go to the school and tell them, sorry, my son cannot come to the school for the next week because he is sick. The system should let know automatically. It should flow the information. And if you have a smart educational system, your son shouldn't miss a class. He should be able to get the classes on his local computer, on his local pad, have access to the information. If you don't have internet at your home, you can uh, go to the school, do a download for the system, and so your son can actually take the course or the classes that he's missing. Or you can do video conferences and share the information with other schools to share the resources. This is the things you can do to transform. Intelligent transportation, and, and this was a fun. Today I took a ride around Bahamas and I had to go to a couple of meetings, and something wonderful happened. I only encountered two traffic lights. Everything works around roundabouts. Wow. In Mexico, about 40 something years ago, we developed a city. It was called Satellite City, and it was supposed to be the city of the future. It was designed to have no stop signs. Everything was arranged around roundabouts. The only problem is the roundabout and the Mexicans don't match. So we had to take it off the system. The roundabouts are still there, but you have traffic lights at an intersection. So it's, but imagine having the technology that senses the flow of traffic and lets you in advance modify the flow 
imagine that you have a bus going from north to south at 11, 8 a.m. Everybody has to get to work first. Not in the Bahamas because you don't have traffic lights, but man, in, in a normal city. Okay? You can change the flow of the traffic lights so the bus, the public transportation, can flow faster so everybody can get to work earlier. This is smarter. This is the way of what's happening. And this is one of my last slides is safe city. This is something I've been talking about throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Is the goal or the origins of every government was to keep us safe. And if you don't have a safe country, it's going to be hard to have a smart country. Everybody needs to feel safe, to walk around the streets. And when you have an incident, you know that you can call somebody through an app to a phone, to it, and be able to get help and return to your normal life as soon as possible. This is what the Safe City concept means, is bringing all of the information around public protection and disaster recovery to a single point so you can actually help the people faster. So the people that takes a phone call from the emergency number knows who you are, when you are, when it turns it to the police department, knows where they want to send you and sending the correct officer. And once the incident's over, identify what happened if there was a crime committed, turn it to the judge for further action, analyze all the information so you can actually improve the well-being of the city, the region, of the nation. And this is my, my last slide in summary. The summary of a smart nation is you're sensing everything. Everybody is bringing information into the system. Through where? Through a very good network. A good broadband network. Not every country can afford a big one terabyte network or 10 gigabyte network, but the technology can be handled the way that accordingly. And if you use it successfully, the economies they're generating because you're doing better, you can improve the infrastructure. And all this information goes, like I said, to a centralized place that is being processed. And in here, I would like to take a very important, and I took to heart when they said, leave nobody behind. And I, for 10 years, no, for six years, I was the CIO of Mexico City. And I learned something very important during that time. Mexico City has about 1.5 million elderly people, people over 65 years old. And this is very important because I was very focused on technology and let's do apps and let's put Wi-Fi in the parks and let's put uh, internet centers everywhere. And somebody says, what about the elderly? Oh, we can teach them what, how to use the computer and we can teach them how to press the button and the, the app and says, yeah, we've been doing that. But there are people that cannot do that. And there's another thing. People like to go to the government office sometimes. So when I learned that, it says, wow. So not everybody wants to have a, a really smartphone in their hand and pressing. No. So some people are retired. What they're looking forward every Monday is going to their local office, pick up their social security check. If they have an incident, they pick up the phone if they have a phone, and they want to talk to somebody. The Mexico City has, a, the people that taught me this are the people that have a social program that everybody that has lived, that lives in Mexico City for more than three years, and it's over 65 years old, gets a monthly allowance of 850 pesos. It's not a lot, but it's something. It's about, round numbers, $50 a month. And so these people, don't have money for a phone, don't have money for internet access. So what do we do? We have a free number, we have phone, everybody can share the number, and they call and say, hi. They don't give their card number. They say, my name is Luis Guillot. And so, hi, Mr. Guillot, how can I help you? I need to know the balance of my card. Yes, Mr. Guillot. Oh, I, I see you. Oh, you live in this neighborhood. Yes, yes. Oh, your wife is this. Yes, yes, my wife is this. This, this. You don't ask the, the questions. You are talking and telling him a story to prove that he is who he is. He said, oh, yeah, don't worry. You have uh, 700 pesos left in, in your balance. 
Oh, thank you very much. It was nice talking to you. Yeah. That's leaving no one behind. That's using ICT to make sure that everybody gets access to the government services, either they are computer literate or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, seven, five, sorry, five very, very interesting presentations. Um, and from the presentations, I, I sort of identified four important um, outcomes or themes. That one, the use of ICT is to gather and analyze data. It's so vitally important to be able to um, access and utilize and analyze the data that is enabled by ICT in order to do better planning, to do better policy formulation. Secondly, the ICT provides the means of communication. Um, persons in remote areas are no longer disadvantaged by their distance. They're able to interact with each other and with government. And in the background, private sector is able to provide the means by which um, in, in disaggregated forms, that information may be useful for planning purposes. Um, at inclusion, every single speaker spoke to the importance of inclusion and also ensuring that those that are not technology savvy also have an opportunity to participate and be heard and to contribute. So that is very important. Um, the other thing is innovation. And I think Jan pointed to the fact that out of disaster, which, which often is a good um, it means by which people are prompted to innovate. Uh, a system was put in place by the young man in Guadeloupe, was it was? In Guadeloupe, in order to be able to assist with government services and planning around coastal areas and disaster recovery. And finally, that reliable ICT infrastructure. Um, that is critical in order to support the smart cities of, of which we speak. And I believe many of the SIDS countries have a way to go towards that. Um, it's not a bad story, uh, nonetheless, because the, the experiences that have been shared here, the, the, the direction in which technology is going, the cloud, etc., all of those offer potentials. Um, there are, of course, there's, it's always said that with technology, there's also a downside, and it's important to ensure that uh, persons are secure in their interaction and use of technology going forward, but that's the sort of regulatory framework that governments will continue to examine and continue to have to look at. Now, we're running very, very tight with time. Uh, we only have about another 10 minutes or so if we snatch five minutes off our lunch break. So what I would like to do at this point in time is to open um, the floor for any questions or comments. Well, uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Moderator. I think I just spent two minutes to brief the participants about the e-government survey. That has been really mentioned and discussed by many participants. My department produces the e-government survey. The survey accesses the level of e-government development in all United Nations member states. It aims at helping countries understand where they stand and consider next steps. The status of e-government development is measured by the e-government development index, EGDI. The EGDI measures the levels of online services development, telecommunication, infrastructure, and human capital. The survey shows that the countries are advancing on the EGDI. The average EGDI of a SIDS, unfortunately to say, is below the global average of 0 0.4922. SIDS, which experience significant gains in e-government survey and development over the last two years are those countries, Barbados, Grenada, Dominica, and Suriname. And progress in 
online service and infrastructure deserve particular attention. The survey also points to the continuing digital divide, as mentioned by many of the speakers, and the need to urgently take action to bridge it. E-government can help cities to build resilience to climate change, to support disaster preparedness, among others. It can also help them deliver public services to promote uh, population, the, uh, to, to remote population. The 2030 Agenda recognizes the transformative role of ICT. Therefore, the international and the regional cooperation partnerships of financial resources are all needed to build access to ICT. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, I, I can't see which country it is. Diana. Thank you very much, moderator and everyone. So really commend the excellent presentations that we've heard. I've learned a lot and heard much that I really like. I have to confess, though, that um, I was somewhat looking forward to this uh, session, and um, my expectations were a little different in terms of what would have been treated in this section, this, this session in terms of mobilizing resources and leaving no one behind. So notwithstanding the excellent presentations that we've heard, I feel constrained to mention um, just a couple um, aspects because, first of all, we might inadvertently feed the perception and the narrative that SIDS really don't need resources with which we're often, um, with which we're often confronted. Secondly, I believe it is, it is important that we not be afraid to take on the question of treating with the mobilization of resources because um, SIDS, as we've heard in many of the presentations, have been doing, in many instances, the heavy lifting. And the SIDS have never been about a blame game or, you know, just doom and gloom. We have many challenges, but we also have a great number of success stories that we are very, you know, I think we should be very pleased to share with the rest of the world in terms of how we can move forward in terms of the agenda. And one thing that we realized from the experience of the MDGs is that without the uh, provision of adequate and uh, sufficient resources in a timely manner, we would not achieve our objectives. And of course, um, I think finally, although, although 2030 seems to be a long time away, in fact, um, it is my, my belief that we just have a narrow window of opportunity in terms of investing in transformation. Because many of the big programs, many of the big projects, in fact, like energy and some infrastructure aspects, have a particular gestation period. And unless we make the right kinds of investments now, we're not going to get to um, the outcome that we want. So perhaps in closing up, uh, a takeaway or two takeaways we can have is really the importance of, um, I think it was mentioned um, earlier, uh, front-loading investment and perhaps how we can do that um, so that we get SIDS really very much on the road in terms of progressing towards the implementation of Samoa and the SDGs. And finally, perhaps something that was mentioned by the Minister of Grenada on Tuesday in his presentation, this idea of incentivizing implementation, because implementation has traditionally been the very... Uh, strong area of, 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 of weakness, if I may put it in that way. So if we can some way incentivize um, implementation at an early period so that the momentum is built and we can move towards, I think that would be, that would be, that would be good. But I would certainly hope that we do not leave our symposium without a good um, consideration of adequate resources and leaving the one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions at this time? Thank you very much, and let me thank the panelists for excellent presentation. What we are looking at is the outcomes, what it is that we want to, to achieve, and we're linking it with the sustainable development goals that we have all signed up to. And there are different tracks on which we are running. 
ICT, I have no doubt, is the one that will bring transformation. But there are a lot of constraints for seeds. We are making progress incrementally. In Grenada, we have a program of e-government and a dedicated ministry of ICT. And we are seeing reforms taking place. We started, though, by looking at our legislation, mm -hmm. because that is critical. Certain things you cannot do, and as you know, the, in the public service, if it is not legislated, then you don't get done. So we looked at our legislation, and I'll give you one example. If you want a birth certificate, in our laws, it must be handwritten. Okay. So we had to change the law <laughs> to make it electronic. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think of the security features you know, to make it secure and, and, and safe. But the thing that introduced it, we need to also recognize that we have to do a lot of training. We pronounce in our ICT policy the introduction of computers and laptops in the schools only to discover that the teachers cannot do that, cannot teach it because they weren't trained to do that. So then we had to, before we could bring in the laptop, we had to train the teachers. Because in fact, some of the students are more advanced than the teachers because they come from home that have internet and they're exposed to certain gadgets and so on. And so they, we have to take a holistic approach to it and decide, as I said, in greater case, incrementally what needs to be done so we have a solid foundation on which to build and we'll get to the levels like some other countries because we have committed resources to it. And resources and implementation of ICT are mutually dependent. They are not mutually exclusive. So we need to get both of them, the resources to help us as we move forward to transform our economy in implementing the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Jamaica. Jamaica. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank the panelists. It was indeed an interesting discussion. But I also must agree with Guyana in terms of what my expectations of this session was about. And in terms of looking at the leading question, I have a particular interest in question four. And I which deals with the technology facilitation mechanism and support for SIDS in fast tracking their ICT needs. And I throw that out to the session to see whether or not there can be some light shed on these issues for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps what I can do is invite, having had a sort of four interventions, if I can just pause here and invite members of the panel to specifically, in particular, address the point raised by both Jamaica and Guyana with respect to resources um, for, for SIDS countries and the assistance that they can get in fast tracking their ICT needs and their programs. Um, perhaps if I can start with Lewis. Okay, in, in both instances, Guyana and Jamaica um, felt that they needed to hear a little bit more about accessing or getting assistance with building resources within their various, within their jurisdictions so that they can fast track ICT programs in, in support of the sustain, sustainable development goals, in a nutshell. So, so you're interested in how to build the resources or how to get access to financial resources? To, to build the resources is, it, it's it's a hard process, and it's you, you're going to have to change procedures, laws, and you have to have the willingness of the of the government and the government employees to transform the way you're doing now to where you should or where you should or where you want to go. Uh, we had three great examples of transformation before us: it's the Korea, Singapore, and Estonia. And what those three countries really have in common is they decided that the way they were doing things wasn't taking them where they wanted to go, and they made a conscious decision to transform and change the way they were doing things. They involved ICT 
in that transformation. And that, that takes a lot of effort and it will hurt. But it, it's, it's not an ICT problem, it's a human problem. It's something that the government officials have to uh, acknowledge and decide to go to the transformation. Thank you. Sorry, in, ter in terms of the funding resources, because our question four specifically spoke about um, support and funding sources that can assist SIDS in fast tracking. And perhaps maybe, I know that this, the, the mention of the hubs by Mr. Ahmad may be in, uh, supportive in this regard. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I would like to add something uh, that has not been mentioned here and maybe that partially answers the questions. In my experience working with SIDS and especially LDCs, there are two major problems. One of the problems is the cost of access to the internet, the broadband access. Uh, just to give you an idea, in many LDCs, many SIDS that I've worked with, the average income of a person may be around 500 to $600, but to uh, get a broadband access, so for example, I have broadband access at my home in the United States, it cost me $20 a month, and for most of these countries, the cost of broadband access is $1,000 a month. Okay, I wanna repeat it. For places where the salaries of the people are around $500 to $600 a month, the cost of access to the internet is $1,000 to $1,100 a month. With that type of a situation, all these ideas of moving everything to the cloud, having smart cities very and smart uh, governments with heavily loaded uh, uh, technologies does not make any sense. So that question has to be addressed. Uh, I'm a professor of telecommunications and uh, I mean, but I am still confounded by the fact that there are so many solutions available. Why is it that today, I mean, I heard this 10 years ago, I've been hearing it every year that it's just around the corner that everybody will have connectivity. But I'm talking about last month, I was given a bill for $1,100 a month just for connecting to the internet. So with that type of a situation, uh, that's why my option of having these small hubs in remote areas, which the collaboration network I showed, can be very low speed where they can communicate even through batches, but once they get to our site, then we can provide all the capabilities. So, so that, that's one major issue that I'm dealing with. I don't know what the solution to that is, uh, other than somehow, uh, mobilizing a totally different task force. The second thing is that the gentleman uh, from Granada I mentioned, I 100% agree the education is a major problem. We did an experiment with Tanzania where uh, we actually wanted to teach, uh, at, uh, to give ICT education to the students, and very quickly we found out that most of the teachers did not know anything about ICT. So we uh, changed the program from students to teachers, we were expecting 30 students uh, to show up, and we got 120 students in the first batch. Uh, next batch, we had 600 students. A lot of these students are uh, either high, uh, teachers, uh, plus they're also uh, uh, themselves, uh, we're working with the university in Tanzania, but, but the they are uh, getting a bachelor's degree in education. So that's a very good area of work to actually educate the uh, students who are trying to get a degree in education on ICT, not only just ICT in the office, of course, but how to use ICT to teach geography, for example, how to teach in science. So, I mean, this is a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in uh, those type of areas, but the communication cost and education, those are the, uh, the two major areas that I get hit every time I turn around. It just, just no, it's relentless. Uh, so we can keep talking about, uh, you know, the, on the uh, all these diagrams of everybody being connected, but we have to get uh, real about the reality of it 
that in a lot of cases, uh, and even the uh, the major reason for e-government usage is so low is because it cannot be connected to the services. So, so it, this, to me, those are the two major problems. And of course, the financial resources uh, that are needed uh, to move the ball forward. I think that's my issue. I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer, but I have at least identified two problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmad. And perhaps what I can do uh, very quickly, Leon, is to speak to what is taking place within CARICOM and Canto that might be able to uh, provide some, some type of support, financial or otherwise. Madam Chair, I think the, the countries are all, as I do, in the, in the Caribbean, all on different tracks. Um, I heard the speaker this morning, or, or someone from the chair, spoke about stealing. So I go down to Trinidad, and I look at their fast forward program, and I steal it. I go to Trinidad and look at their e-governments, and I steal it. I go to Jamaica and sit with Minister Powell and look at what Jamaica was doing in terms of education, one iPad, one um, and steal it. I go to Antigua and sit down with Dr. Manso when he was minister and saw how they took jitney buses and cut and convert them into mobile computer labs for the school and steal it. And so we've got to work collaboratively through CARICOM. The challenges that we have within the Caribbean, the OECD said in its 2012 report concerning ICTs in the Caribbean, that until the governments invest the ICTs are basically being run by, in the Caribbean by two major companies, Digicel and Cable and Wireless. I just went down to UTS. In fact, um, in Curacao, I'm sending two of my vice presidents down. Curacao has built a tier four data center. The only 40 in the world. Curacao has a tier four data center, certified tier four data center. We've got to work collaboratively with the harmonization of what we are doing through CARICOM and through Canto and work together as a team. In the Bahamas, when I was building the submarine cable back in 2004 to five islands, the Prime Minister, um, Perry Gladstone and Christie said to me, Leon, can the folks in Inagua and Megawana get GSM services, LT services, and internet services? Would the schools be able to get? I said, no. He said, well, build the cable to Inagua, Megawana, and so There was no business case for it. In the private sector, with cable and wireless in charge of BTC, that will never happen again because the prime minister cannot direct it. And so we've got this dichotomy within the Caribbean um, where the funding either has to go through places like CARICOM to work uh, cooperatively and harmonize what we want to do. And then go back to the old school, the Ericsson's, and to the Huawei's who got our 4G, built our 4G network, and say to them, let's go ahead and do um, discounts, global discounts. So we look at volume buying and get volume discounts for what we do if we harmonize what we are doing within the Caribbean. I think that's the way forward. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, perhaps if I can ask Microsoft, who has, is doing a lot in terms of moving the SDG agenda through ICTs to, to speak specifically to the issue of um, so resources and funding resources, if, if you're able to. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would like to encourage the Jamaica and my other uh, fellows here with Barbados that do not fear the lack of knowledge of our teachers our, uh, against our students. I have been professor at the university for 44 years. That is not the main problem. The main problem is not that we teach the teachers, which we are doing. We have a program which is called PEEL. It's a massive program to teach teachers. The problem is that the teacher understand that the kids that they are teaching are in a world of uh, ITC, ICT. And they leave that and they live for that. And the education is changing, not because we want to change it, it's because the education has to change, has to evolve. Th uh, 50 years ago, the first Five megabytes were transported and needed a cargo an amp. Five mega. 35 years ago, when I did my dissertation at Stanford, the computers were 360K. The, the data that we can, could manage. This thing, this one here, 
has 124 gigas. This has 512 gigas of fast data. The problem now is how to use that in the census way that we should at this moment. This is a revolution, not an evolution. Evolution is too slow. Technology is fast. People is fast. I, internet of people, do not fear for lack of resources. Think big and show with prototypes what you can do when the resources come, but think big. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask Jan to give some closing comments, no? Yes, thank you. Um, just a reaction about uh, cl uh, cloud computing. Indeed, uh, represent, uh, cloud computing um, represents great potential. Uh, it is a cheap and effective a way to make innovative service accessible. However, we must bear in mind that the life, sp uh, the life span of fiber optics cables may be very short when faced with a major natural disaster. The risk should not be under, uh, underestimated when developing essential public services in the seeds. So developing decentralized and resilient infrastructures is uh, far from outdated in my eyes, and it is not that uh, so expensive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a little over time, and I know that there is another set, a lunchtime session. Um, I don't know if there are any other burning comments, questions from the floor. Um, no? I would like to thank you all for your patience, your involvement, your contributions. Um, this is always a very exciting area to discuss because this is the area, as I said, that we come down to the nuts and bolts of how can we actually go about implementing this SDG. Um, the potential is limitless, um, and certainly each day, as, as was stressed here, we're looking at changes that further improve what's taking place in the ICT world. Uh, the e-government service that was mentioned by Under Secretary Wu, uh, the sorry, survey, not the service, the survey, it is a service of the United Nations, highly recommended as a tool that allows you to get a sense of where the world is going and not necessarily to adopt everything that may be in there because we realize that we, 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 we're kind of at different stages, but perhaps maybe even adapt some of what is going on. It's an excellent tool. I've worked with it for several years. Um, but it certainly allows us all to um, move in a, in a direction where we can ensure that within our respective jurisdictions, no one is actually being left behind. And ICT, for me, initially it was called the information superhighway. To me, it's much more than the information superhighway. It's actually the superstructure on which all of our lives um, will continue to function and operate, at least in, 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 in the... In the distant future unless something else comes along. And undergirding all of that is this, um, this very valuable asset called data. Uh, never underestimate that. It's important uh, for those countries who, are still, who still have vast amount of, m amounts of data that have not been automated. I encourage you to move in that direction. That information is extremely important in policy planning, and there is a lot of it in paper form about. Thank you very much for your attention. This is thank you very much, panelists. Um, I stand between you and lunch, and I shall step back now so that you can move on to lunch. I don't know if we have any housekeeping announcements from the host country. One is no housekeeping. Okay, enjoy your lunch, um, and thank you very much again. Oh, okay. I met a couple of guys out of Fort Lauderdale.